Okay, let's let's walk through that. Let's walk through that. Let's go back to 2015. So, Ju Justin Trudeau was invited by the mavens of the Liberal Party at the end of the. Correct me if I've got any of this wrong, by the way. At the end of the uh, end of the Harper term, Harper had um, been um, running the country for for a substantial period of time. And it's pretty typical for Canadians to throw out whoever's in charge on about a 10-year basis. And so many Canadians felt that it was time for change. And the Liberal Party was in some degree of disarray and the powers that be went to Justin Trudeau. And and I like I had some real trouble with that right at the beginning. Eh? And so I'd kind of like your opinion about that. Um, I'm not a fan of Mr. Trudeau. And so I may have a very biased perspective, but I'd like to at least be accurate in my suppositions. My sense was that he had no right to put himself forward in, in a fundamental ethical sense. He had no right. Uh, he did as a Canadian, obviously, because the only thing that Justin had going for him, apart from his attractiveness and his charm, which are both um, obvious, I would say, he had an extremely famous name. And But I didn't think that it, he had the um, experience or the education to dare to take on a role like that. And then I, you know, I was... I was thinking, well, that's a bit harsh because the Liberals did want someone who had name brand recognition and fair enough. And he could have come to office and surrounded himself with real experts and learned like mad carefully. And perhaps had he had the ability, became a, a stellar leader over some period of time. Although I didn't see much evidence of that either. So, and then he came out with this Sunny Ways campaign. And I think that really did capitalize on his charm and, and, and very effectively. And there was an optimistic mood in Canada at that point with regard to the possibilities of the new leadership. So you were also swept up. And that was reminiscent to me. I was quite young when his father first came to power, but there was a wave of Trudeau mania across the country because Pierre Trudeau Sr., obviously, was um, very charismatic and, uh, and, and had that celebrity-like effect on the Canadian public that his son did. Okay, so now... That's 2015, and Trudeau comes to power, and everybody's looking forward to having that happen. That's when you become parliamentary secretary. Now, you had a, let's say, a detailed plan for something that was quite practical and quite novel on the neuroscience side, let's say, and you produced a plan, and you put it forward to Jerry Butts, and and you, you mentioned someone else at that point. Katie Telford. Right, right. And as far as you could tell, that was rejected out of hand, and you don't believe, perhaps, that it even got to Trudeau's desk. And although you were parliamentary secretary, you didn't have a close relationship with him, and so apparently you weren't even in a position to ask him whether or not he had seen this plan that you had spent some time detailing. Now, I think it would be useful to outline for us what the role of a parliamentary secretary is and what it was that you expected that didn't happen, and whether or not your expectations were actually realistic. Like, and you said, you know, you were disinclined to complain, and you laid out the reasons for that. So, what's the typical? What, as far as you understand, how how are the relations between a prime minister and his parliamentary secretary generally managed, and what is that role generally? So. Typically what happens, and you could check the record because I, I attempt not to say things that are not, that don't have receipts, is that a parliamentary secretary, especially to the prime minister, is sworn into Privy Council and has access to, you know, a, a breadth and depth of information that allows them to carry out their their duties in a way that is fundamental to uh, being able to have these meetings with individuals that are on high level or high level securities. Although I had the security screenings from, from CRA, RCMP, CSIS, that was all done, but wasn't able to have those meetings. Now, when I looked at other relationships with the finance minister, Bill Morneau, and Francois Philippe Champagne, who was his par parliamentary secretary, very close very much uh, constantly having conversations, constantly involved in the policy development, constantly involved in stakeholder engagement and relationships. So there is a, there is a, there's no gaps 
between what the, that minister is doing and what that parliamentary secretary is doing. There has to be a tight relationship. And as a first minister, as, par, as prime minister with the parliamentary secretary, there has to be an even tighter gap. Because if there's any kind of ripples or spaces in between the other ministries, we need to be aware of that. We're, we need to run a tight ship. We have a lot to do on the agenda. So making sure that you have someone that's not only competent, but has their ears to the ground, they, they know what is happening, is what I thought would be the relationship that I had. And I would say that maybe... I don't want to mislead anyone. Maybe it was my fault that that relationship didn't go as well. The first meeting that I had with the prime minister was in December of 2015. And of course, everybody remembers that during that first administration, he had a 50-50 cabinet and he came out and said, you know, that this is the cabinet because it's 2015. Not because the people had merit, not because, you know, I have an excellent lineup. He said it's because it's 2015. It was very disenfranchising. And I think it was very much flippant for someone who was a leader of a G7 country to just say, because it's 2015. Let me me dive into that. Let me dive into that just for a sec, if you don't mind. Well, because that also struck me, that struck me really hard. You know, I spent a lot of time um, assessing the research literature on hiring and determining how you do that if you hire purely on merit, let's say. And merit is defined in relationship to the evidence you have that the people you're attempting to hire actually have the ability to do what that specific job requires. And there are various ways of determining that merit. Huh? You do a job analysis to find out what the job actually entails, and then you go through the person's history and you see if they have the experience and the raw ability. Okay, so now when Trudeau announced that 50-50 cabinet, because it was 2015, I thought something quite similar to what you thought. I thought first, hey, that's pretty damn flippant. And I thought second, you've done something there that's really not good because only 25% of the members of the House of Commons were female. And that means you've reduced your applicant pool a priori by half. And so there's no way that you pulled the most, statistically speaking, purely, there's no possible way that you screened and pulled in the most qualified people into your cabinet. And you did that for show. And so, well, if you cut your applicant pool by half on arbitrary grounds, there might be other reasons to select people, but, but okay, but you had reasons as well. They might not have been the same as mine. I I did. You had reasons for being irritated by that. So, Delve more for me, if you would, into why it it put your teeth on itch. Certainly. And I I, I won't speak to sort of the the skills of the individuals. I think he had a very competent uh, cabinet around him. Uh, the the thing that really struck me with the because it was tw- because it's 2015 is because it was so flippant because it was so it made it seem like it was arbitrary and it made it seem as as you said for show and so i went into that meeting saying to him that look i understand what I, my role here i understand i'm the only one that looks like me but what i said and i quote is if i'm here to fill any gender or racial gap within your cabinet i don't want this role yeah, well, I'm that's not about one of the that. dangers. That that is absolutely one of the <laughs> dangers of gender and and ethnicity selection. Let's say is that you, it, like I saw this at the universities all the time. I think it's a terrible it's a terrible thing to have happen around people who are from a minority background who are truly qualified, because it's hard on them because they don't know why they're selected, and it's hard on everybody else because they don't know why they're selected. And so that's not fun. It's not fun. And and putting that forward right at the beginning, I wanted to put him on notice that I am smart. I'm more than capable. So use me for a particular role that you might have within this this position as parliamentary secretary, but don't for a second think that I would be a token throughout your entire administration. That was the notice that I was putting him under with saying those words. And so after I said that, he said, you know what, Selena, do you trust my judgment? Dude, I met you like five minutes ago. So I said, no, I, I don't trust your judgment. I have no, I have no reason to. I've been married to my 
my partner for 17 years. I hardly trust his judgment most days. But I mean, I have to build a relationship with someone. I'm not going to lie to you and say that I trust your judgment. And I realized at that moment that the tension in the room got a little awkward. America's healthcare system is lacking in any real care. Insurance companies regularly deny progressive treatment options, primary care physicians refuse to order comprehensive lab work, and the standards of care lag years behind the leading research. That's where Merrick Health comes in. Merrick Health represents a paradigm shift in how we approach medicine. The premier health optimization platform, Merrick Health empowers you to maximize your longevity and performance with the confidence that comes from having experts in your back pocket. They offer cutting edge diagnostic labs, concierge health coaching, and expert clinical oversight. They help you achieve your health and fitness goals by leveraging data-driven lifestyle and nutrition recommendations, along with supplement and prescription treatment options. If you're listening to this show, then you're probably a proponent of taking your health into your own hands. That's why we've teamed up with Merrick Health to offer a turnkey optimization package designed for those who want to maximize their performance and longevity with the most elaborate testing on the market. You'll receive extensive lab work, thorough lab reports, video calls with Merrick's health experts, and expedited onboarding. Go to MerrickHealth.com slash Peterson and use code Peterson to get the same panel and medical oversight I get and save 10% at checkout. That's MerrickHealth.com slash Peterson and use code Peterson at checkout. Okay, let's take that apart because, okay, so, yeah, so you, let's you had take that some, apart. Okay, I'm doing my well, whole PhD sure. on this. <laughs> well, for sure. So, look, you, you had some reason to be apprehensive. Two, two reasons, right? The, the first reason you, you, you lined out one is because of the statements that Trudeau made about the composition of his cabinet and how he made that. And then, second, because you were the only black woman in the entire House of Commons. And so, the combination of those two things made, made it, reasonable for you to wonder just what was going on and to make a statement. Now, if I was going to play the devil's advocate, I'd say, um, you know, maybe, and I'm not saying that this is right, but I, because I really do want to go into this. So I want to do it in the most, it may in the harshest way possible. So we get it straight. You know, you might say, and I, I think you kind of alluded to this, given that you said that perhaps you put your foot forward wrong the first meeting. You know, you might say if you were thinking about it strategically, you would have had a calm and somewhat contentless first meeting and just got to know each other a little bit before you put your foot down, so to speak, about the role you were going to play. But but maybe not, too. Maybe the right thing to do was to make your case right off the bat. There's no way I can tell. But But you said that, but you were inclined to do that. And then you said that when you did it, the atmosphere in the room wasn't perhaps what you might have hoped for. So so tell me what you saw. And he asked you to trust him, which is also that's something you remember. And it is an it is a it's a it's a it's it's an event worthy of note. Because the question is, what did he mean? Because you don't know him. Now did he mean you should just trust him because he's Justin Trudeau and he's the Prime Minister of Canada? Or did he mean that you should start out by trusting someone if you're employed by them in a new role? Like I don't know. What did you think? Yeah, you know what? I'm not even sure that question is warranted on the first day. Like, do you trust my judgment on the first day? You've, I mean, I know that you're you're your platform was built by a number of different people. It wasn't just you. Why are you Why are you even asking that question? And why are you asking that question of me? Do you think we could work together? Do you think we could achieve the objectives of our platform? Do you think that we're going to do right by Canadians with this particular mandate? Ask me those questions. I don't really care about your particular mandate. And it really speaks to ego and it really speaks to a a particular sense of awareness or lack thereof that was pretty evident right from the beginning. And if we think about this, this this whole episode, me being in politics has driven me into the, the PhD work that I'm doing right now on motivated cognition and understanding what motivates people, you know, their self-appraisal, their self-enhancement, their self-verification. It was really in that moment seeing that everything that needed to align for for. Justin Trudeau at that moment needed to feed into his feelings or his motivation on self, what he felt about himself. And I came in and, and within that first 15 minutes of a meeting said, uh, no, 
I'm not just going to arbitrarily fall into what you deem to be your methodology around your self-enhancement. That is not my role. My role is to represent the people of Ripley. My role is to make sure that we execute a mandate. And I didn't know that at the time, but it really didn't, spoke didn't to know the what? fact- did- didn't know why. I didn't know at the time that probably that that wasn't the best move to make because I assumed that as his parliamentary secretary, as his right hand person, that he would have wanted someone who was going to be honest. And uh-huh. I don't think that's what he wanted. He wanted someone to confirm a bias that he felt about himself or a lack of self esteem that he felt about himself by saying, Yes, I trust your judgment. Justin, I don't know you, but I'm going to say so yes. Like, I, okay, I could so have played what, okay. that game. I didn't want to. Okay. 